Welcome everybody to the Cambridge Centre for Criminal Justice, the University of Cambridge's webinar this morning on criminal justice, access, architecture and aspirations in a post-COVID-19 COVID future. I'm Nikki Padfield, I'm a professor in the University of Cambridge and I am really grateful to you for being here obviously particularly grateful to our fabulous speakers who have, well, we have um, Carolyn and it's nearly midnight in Australia and Vincent got up early and it's seven o'clock in the morning in Canada. There are doubtless many of you who've come from around the world and we're really grateful. And you're here because it's a really, really important subject. Before we get into the subject in any detail, um, let me start by offering a few other thanks. Dan Bates will be invisible to you, I imagine, unless things go badly wrong. He's our technology expert who makes all of this possible, and I'm really grateful to him. Lorna Cameron, and it's entirely her enthusiasm for this really important subject, which has led to today's webinar. She, I have to say, has done all the work in developing the programme, and I'm sure that everybody here is really grateful to her for the way that she has orchestrated this really important debate. I come to the topic as an academic lawyer with some experience of practice, and I've been very concerned for a number of years about the way criminal justice appears to be shifting away from the traditional court. The pandemic has played a part, but the use of remote access technology or digital justice has been changing the face of justice, the way people can participate in criminal justice for a number of years. From where I sit, there's a real danger, a huge danger that short-sighted economies may prove disastrous to the fairness of criminal justice and indeed un undermine the legitimacy of the system. I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Today's focus is in some ways architectural exploring the effects of design on access to justice through the criminal courts. But to my mind, it's very much more than this. And today's speakers will be raising fundamental questions about the meaning of justice. We hope to time manage the event to hear plenty from the audience, but feel very free to use the chat function for chat. Please focus your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box and we will handle it as best we can. But I'm going to turn now straight away to Lorna. We're up to 70 participants, which is great. I'm going to turn straight to Lorna to introduce the first panel. Over to you, Lorna. Thank you, Nikki. <clears throat> um, in the first panel discussion, we are going to look at what fair access to justice means. Um, this is what we're all sharing as a common denominator and in our attempts to make things work or improve things in all of our different areas of work. Um, in this conversation, we have two panellists, Dr. Carolyn Mackey, who joins us from New South Wales in Australia. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney Law School, teaching criminal law, civil and criminal procedure and digital criminology. And she's co-deputy director of the Sydney Institute for Criminology and is recognised for her research into the technologies of justice, specifically empirical research into prisoners' experiences of accessing justice from a custodial situation by audiovisual links. Our other speaker in this conversation is Professor Penny Cooper, who's a visiting professor at Birkbeck and a practising barrister. Penny's research spans criminal and family and civil law and she has a particular interest in the adaptations which enable effective participation. Her expertise includes advocacy, cross-examination, witness familiarisation, expert evidence, ground rules hearings and special measures for vulnerable witnesses and defendants who I'm sure we all agree are one of the key interfaces that we need to look at in this big topic. Um, to start you, you off with your conversation, I want to ask and I think I'll direct this at Carolyn initially. Um, what is, what do you think access to justice is and is effective participation the same thing? How do we differentiate it for individuals and vulnerable people attending court? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Nikki and Lorna, for inviting me today. And yes, um, I think that we can differentiate access to justice and effective participation. I think access to justice, I see that as more having actual access to uh, to the the legal advice, to to legal represent representation. Uh, for me, it's about equality before the the law, equality of that access. Uh, whereas I, I guess I see effective participation is something more about the comprehension, actually having some understanding of the charges, for example, that have been brought against you in criminal justice, if that's our focus, um, having a comprehension of what actually what is occurring uh, in the legal proceedings in the courtroom itself, having the ability to communicate effectively with the court, with, uh, you know, potentially with the judicial officer, or at least uh, be able to communicate with your legal representative if, if possible as well. So I, I do actually see a distinction between those two um, concepts. Penny, what are your thoughts on that? You're muted, Penny. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you as well for inviting me, uh, Lorna, Nikki and Dan, for your technical support. So um, like Carolyn, I think there is a difference. And as I was preparing for this seminar, my thoughts turned to an analogy, which I haven't used before. So if people think it's rubbish, I'd be grateful if they, they told me that. But I think the analogy is if the criminal justice system is, is a house, access to justice is getting to the front door. Do you Can you afford to get there? Are you going to be let in once you get there? And then the effective participation is what happens once you're inside this house of criminal justice system. Do people ignore you or do they communicate clearly with you? Do you get to do what you want to do when you get there? Um, that might include sitting in a corner quietly and exercising your right not to say very much. So I do see a distinction uh, like Carolyn does. Okay, so if we're talking about um, a difference between physical access and, and engagement, um, if you like, with the process once you get there, how do we reflect this um, in the interstitial spaces where we're using video linked hearings? So I'm talking about um, people who are in custody, um, who are in a video suite perhaps, and accessing the court from that space. How, how do we how do we allow those people to participate effectively? Well, I think Caroline, you've written the book pretty much <laughs> on this. So I'm going to defer to you, but I might just start off by saying what we really need is research. And it's shocking really how little research there is, how little empirical research there is with lay participants, including defendants not only about their participation when it's digitized, but also when it's actually in person. But I'm gonna hand over to you, Carolyn. Um, <laughs> thank you, Penny. Um, yeah, look, I think it's, it's a really great question to ask. And I think we can't help but um, talk about this in terms of what's happened over the last uh, 12 months with uh, the pandemic and how for the very first time in living memory, um, I've, I've got a quote from, from my Chief Justice of the New South Wales Supreme Court sort of saying, first time in living memory where physical presence in court has effectively been prohibited uh, due, due to that pandemic. And um, I think, what we can see is that um, audio visual links have enabled the, the uh, you know, wheels of justice to continue turning to a certain extent um, in most jurisdictions, even though courts as well as prisons have very much gone into lockdown, uh, at least in Australia. So we can sort of see that this technology has become very much a, a part of you know, courtroom infrastructure. Um, and it has enabled remote uh, hearings. It has in enabled the emergence of digital justice, I guess. However, I agree with Penny very much that we, this has kind of occurred. It's this amazing bit of a, you know, social experiment that's gone on. This incredible large scale pilot has occurred 
fairly rapidly and without necessarily having all the, the knowledge and research that we need uh, to have been done at this moment. So I do think that there have been, the courts have noticed that there have been major problems with people being able to effectively participate during the last um, uh, 12 months or so, you know, since March, I guess, since last, uh, yeah, when the World Health um, Organization, um, you know, told us that there was actually a pandemic occurring, we can actually see that this emergent body of so-called coronavirus jurisprudence is showing the impacts um, on people's ability to participate. Now, of course, there's a lot of case law that suggests it's been great. And I think especially in civil jurisdictions, um, quite a lot of that has been able to uh, to, con to, to continue and people have been able to effectively participate. But there have been a number of problems, um, particularly in criminal uh, jurisdiction, where people have not been able to participate effectively. Um, and courts have basically said to continue with this trial uh, as a virtual trial or as an e-trial would actually uh, result in an injustice uh, and unfair proceeding to that uh, particular defendant. So yeah, it's it's really interesting to see this emergent coronavirus jurisprudence and, and what that tells us about, about access to justice and uh, uh, effective uh, participation. Thank you. Um, we've got a bit of time. Uh, I wondered if you would give me your thoughts now. Um, uh, we we touched on this a few years ago when you were visiting and you spoke um, in Cambridge. Uh, and we talked about protocols, spatial and process protocols for the prison linked um, spaces where prisoners are basically trying to connect with the court. And there were prison officers there who were saying that they had disaffected prisoners who weren't engaging. And uh, of course, Penny will know because of her, her specialisms that this is something that also affects people who are, who are vulnerable in other ways um, because they simply cannot access uh, effectively in a space that's distanced from the court. So what do you think now um, about the idea of protocols and formally um, creating these spaces in a way that is consistent and fair across the board because it's very much an ad hoc situation at the moment yeah it, it, i mean it's a massive job isn't it it's a massive reform uh, that needs to take place i think at the moment we're in a phase of necessity having become the mother of invention so things like for example remote assessments of vulnerable witnesses and defendants have taken place by intermediaries who are assessing people's communication needs and abilities. They were perhaps skeptical at first, but have found ways to assess people's communication needs and, uh, and, and abilities, and then translate them into suggestions for adaptations. But then we come up against, I think what at the moment is the most significant problem in the criminal justice system, which is the Crown Court having had real difficulty with jury trials, trying to construct them in such a way that keeps people safe and socially distant. So now we've got, on top of a system that was already um, short on money and suffering delays, is now even shorter, if you like, on resources compared to what it needs. And the delays have become massive. So the challenge is, is absolutely huge. Um, needless to say, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> well, we're here to explore. Um, none of us really has all the answers. Um, Carolyn, any ideas? Yes, I mean, again, the same is occurring in Australia that um, there's been sort of massive delays um, are occurring in the criminal justice system in particular. Um, I mean, it's interesting if we're looking at court protocols, I've actually just finished drafting a, a um, journal article called Glitching Justice, and I'm very much focusing on the audio elements of the audio visual link, whereas 
my earlier research has very much looked at the visual, but how about the audio? Um, and it's really interesting. I've looked at case law from Australia, New Zealand, and England and Wales uh, to sort of try and catch, capture a sense of what happens when the technology from a sonic point of view, when it fails. And of course, I think there's massive uh, problems for procedure when you cannot actually hear what people are saying when words um, disappear you know when the technology sort of glitches and things are lost it corrupts um, transcripts for example but um, it also we're, we're now looking at these new protocols sort of perhaps coming back to your question Lorna those questions of um, new protocols in court and of course the the waiving protocols are very much coming up and uh, you know when you look at the cases there's a number of cases where uh, it's evident that a defendant for example has been histrionically waving to try and say you know I can't hear. Um, and uh, I think that's really unfortunate that uh, there aren't sort of really good protocols in place to, to make sure that people can continuously hear, especially if they are a defendant and they're defending themselves uh, in a criminal matter. Um, terrible audio issues, of course, with other parts of criminal procedure. Um, you know, where do we place uh, interpreters in a criminal, um, in a remote criminal um, proceeding as well can be very, very difficult. But I think it's really important that we do look at the plight of um, defendants and certainly other vulnerable participants in the criminal justice system. These are the people who bear the brunt of um, massive changes to the criminal um, procedure. We had to sort of very much make sure that we can try and um, develop new protocols to uh, ensure that they um, are included uh, in the actual procedure as much as possible. But it's again, like Penny, I go, yeah, it's a bit of a work in progress at the moment. Thank you. Um, I think it's something that we, we could look at and that it ought to be formalized across the board in different jurisdictions, obviously. But it's the, the only way for it to be fair. But of course, when you start looking at how you make it fair, you have to really understand what it is you're doing and, and what you're replacing. You know, so if you're replacing a, an actual contact of a person in a space with that person in that space, and you're doing it over a video link, what is it exactly that you're trying to create a protocol for? You know, is it just um, that they can observe or are they going to be supported in actual participation in, in, the, in, in prisoners' cases in prisons in their own trials? So um, those things need, need to be looked at. Um, I'd like to, um, I can't see any questions uh, from where I'm sitting. So I wonder, Nikki, do you have any questions for me, the audience that you might like to put here? I know that Carolyn had a couple of slides. I think it would be very useful if she'd share her slides with us and hear a bit oh, more yeah. what she was planning That's to say. Great. Oh, okay. Um, can you see those slides? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, yes, oh, thank you. I was just going to quickly give a bit of background to my research, which you've already really done anyway. So I'll just sort of very quickly say that basically most of my research uh, since my PhD has focused on the prison endpoint of the audiovisual links. So I've spent a lot of time in prison talking to prisoners about their experience of using this technology to access justice, to actually appear in remote courtrooms and for um, legal conferencing or just to get. Um, you know, other forms of legal advice and as well as a, a multitude of other reasons. Um, these are just a couple of the um, publications that I've written that are relevant to what we're looking at today. Um, I was, um, I just started mentioning about this article that I've drafted on glitching Justice and video links looking at the conflation of the courtroom with custodial spaces as well and what does that mean in terms of justice um, and then finally um, I've also been writing, um, doing some research, again, very much informed by coronavirus jurisprudence and looking at the impact of the prison lockdown 
and what that can tell us perhaps of the move towards smart prisons, technologized prisons. So it's a little bit kind of off topic, but slightly on topic with what we're looking at, because part of this journal article, I'm looking at the case law that's come out of the um, pandemic and talking about the lockdowns of prisons and how that stopped obviously people uh, from having physical in-person family visits, but more to the point, more to more to the point um, of relevance to today is the stopping of in-person legal visits and what that actually means for people um, to be able to effectively prepare their defence uh, and therefore to effectively uh, participate in their own court matters. So it's sort of interesting that there's been uh, various cases that have talked about um, the impact of that prison lockdown and being a barrier to effective participation and effective defence. Um, and basically, you know, a judge in, in one court saying it may be more difficult to facilitate satisfactory interaction between the applicant and his defence team um, when you're only able to talk to your lawyer uh, through the video link instead of actually having a face-to-face -face meeting in the prison. So that was just sort of one thing I wanted to mention. And then just finally, I was also going to mention that um, I'm really delighted that I've uh, been the recipient of an Australian Research Council award that I'll start um, on the 1st of July, 2021, and that goes through to 2024. Um, and this is a piece of research again, that hopefully will come up with a few answers and a few recommendations that will hopefully inform further discussions like we're having today, um, very much looking at this notion of um, digital vulnerability. What is that? We have this, you know, very much digital justice uh, that we uh, are using in many parts of the world now. Uh, but of course, we know that so many people, especially in criminal justice, as well as in civil justice, are vulnerable people. Um, and so I'm sort of very much interested in trying to understand what is this slippery term vulnerability and how does it interact with this digital realm that we're now faced with. So um, there are just a couple of the slides that I was going to mention today. Thank you. Um, Penny, did you have a presentation you wanted to make on your recent research? I, I, I know that time is short, but if I may, I'll do this in a, a rather old fashioned way. And I'll just hold up a book. I'm not saying <laughs> anything, but this book is the product of a research project, a major research project that was funded by the Nuffield Foundation and, and along with my colleagues at the Institute of Crime and Justice Policy Research at Birkbeck, we have produced what is an open access book called Participation in Courts and Tribunals and you can get that from the Bristol University Press website. And I just remembered something as well about protocols. And if I may have 30 seconds to mention this, I think it really is important that everyone, including maybe especially lawyers, think about why they're introducing the protocols. Because you hear of examples and you think, hmm, maybe a little more thought should go into that. Um, one example is that, uh, and this was actually in a civil arbitration, the lawyers wanted the witness to sit in front of a mirror so that they could see everything that was going on in the room, just in case something untoward quite what, I don't know, um, what they were expecting to happen. But uh, that's, that seems like quite an odd re request for a protocol. And then the other one, which was adopted quite quickly, was removal of wigs and gowns for people accessing hearings in England and Wales from their home, which one can see some obvious reasons for that. The downside of it perhaps being that lay participants are wondering just who all these different people are. So is there some means of indicating through dress? Maybe it's wearing bands, not gowns and wigs. I don't know, but a little bit more thought uh, can go into these protocols because at the moment we are, yeah, I think we're, ju we're just involved in a big experiment uh, and doing these things quite quickly. Thank you, Penny. I can vouch for that book, everybody. Oh, <laughs> um, I barge yeah. in with a question at this point from, from our audience, which is um, a lot of the academic concern has, of course, been about access to justice and participation for vulnerable witnesses, especially the defendant. But Alistair Smith asks, I think, a really important question. 
which are there are genuine challenges to advocacy through remote media and a perception that remote arguments are less effective arguments. Has there been any research on how the trial process is less more effective when done remotely? Um, Carolyn raised the question as to whether the lawyer should be in the room with their client. Uh, I've sat in on England and Welsh um, video parole board hearings when the lawyer would be with the client. And I have to say my instinctive response is to have the lawyer in a room with their client is much better than to have the person in prison or even in their own home totally isolated from their lawyer and not knowing how they can talk to their lawyer. But again, that does have a knock on effect to the quality of the advocacy. So I think this is a really interesting question and I interrupt to ask it and invite both Carolyn and Penny to respond to it. I think it's a it's an excellent question. I'm actually starting to do some research again, going back into coronavirus jurisprudence. And unfortunately, I haven't sort of finished that. So I haven't got a really hard and fast answer at the moment. But I'm particularly looking at the impacts on cross examination. So how can we actually cross examine witnesses? Um, if we're all in different parts of um, of you know we're all completely separate um what, what is the process of trying to you know perhaps intimidates not the quite the right word but uh to have a, a little bit of coercive pressure on people when we know that actually witnesses at least in australia are apparently turning up from all sorts of places uh, i heard an anecdote that um, a witness appeared while they were driving their truck um and you know how can you actually seriously try and cross-examine somebody if they're just um you know driving their truck and appearing in court at the same time time the the actual um, spatial um, elements have totally gone from the gravitas of that courtroom and that ability to perhaps uh, apply some level of acceptable coercion against a uh, uh, a witness I guess so um, I'm sort of interested there have been some cases to suggest that uh, the inability to cross-examine successfully in a criminal justice realm may end up being um, an unfair trial to um, a defendant but I haven't sort of got to anything further than that at the moment, unfortunately. And it, it, I, I agree with Caroline. It, Caroline, it's an excellent question and, and we need more research about it. The advocacy is one side of it. The impact on the witnesses is another side of it and the impact on the fact finders. And we need cross-disciplinary research, I think lawyers with psychologists, first and foremost, to understand what the difference is. Because at the moment, it seems to me, just sort of anecdotally, you've got people falling into a couple of camps. One is the traditional way is best and we need to do it in person. You just can't evaluate a witness, for example, in the same way over a remote link versus the other camp, which is for digitization. And we need to really meet somewhere in the middle with the benefit of research and research on things like trauma. I've been aware for a number of years from working with intermediaries that trauma is something they're serious, they've been seriously concerned about and trying to educate people about because it affects memory, it affects expressive communication, it affects receptive communication, it affects the way someone presents. All these things are really, really important. But you know what, what difference is it gonna make if it's digitized, it could be better or it could be worse for some witnesses. We just don't know. So yes, advocacy, we need more research on that, but equally other aspects as well. Thank the you. The answer to the question is that we don't have a clear research yet. This is an area which is astonishingly lacking in research. Yeah. Two other questions to raise at this moment, Carl Leclerc, it's, I don't think it's so much a question as to point out that actually access to the internet is a precursor to access to justice. So we sure do have to remember that. 
And then a really interesting question from Bradley Reed, who I don't know who Bradley Reed is and whether he works for HMPPS in um, England and Wales, pointing out that um, HMP, the prison system in this country, is investing 59 million in video conferencing suites. 10 have been built, some as large as 16 rooms with another six more suites on the way. The rationale varies, but a recent internal note states a number of benefits these are all focused mostly on victims and prison security improvements. Little suggests that it's concerned with access or participation for defendants. How can defendant participation and physical access to a court room be protected? Do legal protections need to be considered? I think it's such an interesting question and I hope lots of people from HMPPS will watch this recording later on um, because it's not only the court service which needs to worry about this, of course the prison system does. And I rather hope that this video conferencing suites were largely designed to allow visits for prisoners to talk to their families, but I'm probably naive and wrong. Carolyn and Penny again. Certainly um, in Australia, the default position is uh, appearing by audiovisual link for a vast range of criminal procedure now. Pretty much until the, before the pandemic, the only thing that was always going to be in person was a trial, but of course that is now um, disappearing. Uh, certainly the legislation in Australia typically suggests that you cannot opt in or opt out of using vid video uh, audio visual link type te technologies and I'm assuming it's probably very similar in England and Wales that there I'm not sure if there is any opt-in or opt-out provision in your legislation but I do think that at the moment that the um, system has you know is is I guess ne necessarily sort of one size fits all um, and that's not going to work for a lot of people who don't have the resilience to actually um, be conducting their affairs using this type of technology. Um, certainly in terms of civil jurisdiction, for example, and as one of the other uh, attendees has mentioned, you need to have the internet. Um, so <laughs> again, there is, we've got people who are vulnerable for a range of reasons, you know, perhaps to do with their neurodiversity or their cognitive situation or whatever, uh, you know, there's a range of, of vulnerabilities that are there. But of course, we have a class of people who are still digitally excluded um, as well. So um, again, can those people opt in or opt out? Well, they can't opt in unless they've got access to the internet. And I think we can see that the internet now is a core utility in our 21st century life. It is as core as water and electricity and, and a sewerage system. So um, yeah, uh, again, <laughs> I'm not quite sure if that sort of answers the question at all. So it looks like we've got a lot of work to do, all of us in all these different all our different disciplines and practices. And um, thank you both for discussing that particular point, which I think revealed a lot of very interesting open areas for future research. Um, I need to move on now to the next discussion because we're running out of time already. Um, the next discussion is about place, placemaking and materiality. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Alex Jeffrey and Dr. Vincent Dinell, um, which I may not have pronounced correctly, Vincent, sorry. Um, Alex is a reader in human geography at Cambridge University and as a political geographer, has a particular interest in processes of state building, the geographies of war crimes trials, the contested nature of citizenship in divided societies. And Vincent is an SSHRC postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Education and Counselling um, psychology, sorry, counselling psychology at McGill University in Canada and a lecturer in the Faculty of Laws at the University of Sherbrooke. He, he holds a PhD in communication and a Master of Laws and his research um, focuses on issues related to witness testimony, credibility assessments, deception detection, non-verbal behaviour in courtrooms. Um, Alex, would you like to present yourself? Absolutely, thank you. Thanks a lot for organising uh, the session today. I've just been um, completely fascinated by the initial exchanges between Carolyn and and uh, and Penny, and and kind of want to hear more about about their their work as well. But um, just to to say a little bit about my, my particular position, um, 
uh, on some of these issues. I'm a human geographer um, and I'm interested in the role of law in consolidating post-conflict states. And I've spent about a decade looking at uh, the kind of politics of the creation of a new legal system in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and in particular thinking about the um, creation of the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, which since uh, 2005 has taken an increasing role in uh, war crimes trials, um, particularly since the closure of the ICTY, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, so this, this work has been interested in the, the, the nature of court spaces, the, uh, the kind of politics around the creation of legal, new legal codes, as well as a kind of wider set of social issues related to the associations and organizations that have assisted in the establishment of, um, of trials. And I published uh, this work um, principally in a book last year uh, called uh, The Edge of Law in the Cambridge series um, in Law and Society. I would hold up a copy of uh, the book were I not in uh, our spare room <laughs> rather than my office where the book is located. Anyway, um, so, so just, just quickly, what did I, I say in this, in this book to give a framing for the, for the discussion? Well, <clears throat> I, was, I was interested in, in uh, you know, the question of how a new legal system is established in a divided and antagonistic political context. You know, through what mechanisms can its legitimacy be um, achieved? And you know, materiality, which is the, 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 one of the issues that we're thinking about today, was at the forefront of, of many of these questions, thinking about the kinds of buildings, bodies and materials through which law was practiced um, and how this plays a kind of ambiguous role in the communication of the legitimacy of law. And I'll, I'll just say three points and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. They, they sort of intersect with the discussions we've had today so far. Um, the first um, point to make um, was that the discourse that surrounded the establishment of the court of Bosnia was one of localizing the war crimes process, which precisely puts this point about proximity um, front and center, the idea that, that, that localizing law was virtuous in the sense of it bringing law uh, uh, to, to the Bosnian people. Um, uh, and you know, and, and, and challenge the idea of its remoteness while, while it was being handled, uh, war crimes trials being handled at The Hague. Uh, the narrative, this narrative was unsettled by the central role that was played by international actors in establishing the criminal code. Um, and uh, in, in terms of, at least initially, in terms of the international judiciary. Um, but the problems around localization were also kind of, kind of felt in the very architecture of law. Localizing the legal process required locating the court within the contested urban landscape of contemporary Sarajevo. Uh, in doing so, the site of the court, which is a, a former army barracks, uh, was kind of highly contested. It, it was itself the site of war crimes during the conflict in the 1990s. So far from the experience of, say, post-apartheid South Africa, where Carol Clarkson speaks of new courts as aesthetic acts that embed a new political system. Rather, the court has somewhat characterized a continuing ethnic division that shapes Bosnian politics, and the, its very materiality and architecture was drawn into those, those discussions. Um, secondly, you know, the, the work has, has highlighted the importance of thinking of materiality beyond fixed notions of of place and thinking about, uh, and, and the discussion today has illuminated this really kind of admirably already, <laughs> the idea that actually the, 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 the practice of law is distributed through a whole set of, of, of infrastructures, uh, material and dematerial, embodied and disembodied, that, that allow it to be uh, uh, reproduced and secure its, its legitimacy. One of the aspects of the book is to think about the distinction between invited and invented spaces of justice. So where kind of the formal court space meets the much more informal sites where NGOs are trying to uh, 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 enroll participants within the court process. And the final point I wanna make, and I'll stop, was about uh, the, the kind of questions around access to justice and effective participation, precisely where we, where we started today. That, actually the, the, the practice of attending trials in person wasn't clearly wasn't always virtuous or, 
or welcomed as it was expected in the more celebratory accounts of localizing war crimes trials. Uh, across the research, and the book goes into this in some detail, the particular concerns around the re-traumatizing effect of having to give witness testimony, the lack of psychological support for witnesses, uh, dissatisfaction um, also around the leniency of, of sentences and how that was kind of performed within court space and the celebration of uh, celebratory acts by, by defendants. Um, you know, in a sense, it points to the limits of a retributive legal system and meeting expectations of justice amongst traumatized communities. This visibility of justice doesn't always mean justice is being seen to be done. And I'll end my comments there. Thank you. Um, I have lots to say about that, but actually I'm going to let Vincent uh, present his work because I think it's it's where your, where both of your, your areas can combined that I think we're going to get some really interesting discussion. So Vincent, would you like to present your work? Thank you very much, Lorna, and thank you, Nikki, for the invitation. Um, I'm very grateful to be here today. Uh, yeah, so in the, in the past uh, qu quite a few years now, I've been working and studying the impact of nonverbal communication in courtrooms. It started with uh, my Master's of Law where I looked at court judgment and um, moments where judges refer to nonverbal behaviors. And uh, the conclusion that I had made uh, in that Masters of Law was that, well, when nonverbal communication is mentioned in, in uh, court judgments, there are many times where um, the way it is interpreted is um, not totally in accordance with uh, scientific research. In other words, there's a lot of uh, wrong beliefs and stereotypes that are associated with nonverbal behavior. And then um, after the master's of law, I looked at, uh, in my PhD in communication, I looked at uh, deception in court. And essentially what I looked at was deception judgments, um, perjury judgments, sorry, where uh, judges have to decide if a witness lied or not in a previous trial. And uh, what came out of the data was that again, when it comes to deception judgment, so when judges have to decide if a witness lied or not, there's also a lot of uh, uh, bias and stereotypes that are used in deciding if someone is truthful or not. And uh, besides, uh, between the, the masters of law and the PhD in communication, I. I really uh, try to focus on the impact of nonverbal communication in courtrooms. And as uh, some of you probably know, there are thousands of peer reviewed uh, publications on nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication is a very, very, very large field of research. And unfortunately, it is the impact of nonverbal communication in courtroom is not uh, studied a lot. And with the virtual trials, that are now uh, getting more and more popular, it brings back that question, which was in the past years really understudied. So what is nonverbal communication and how it affects the courtroom interaction? What is the impact on the judge, on the witness? Uh, what is the impact on uh, the lawyers? Um, it, it brings back first and foremost, the question, what is nonverbal communication? And nonverbal communication essentially refers to communication without words. So that means it means, yes, design, arrangement of courts and courtrooms, the appearance features of witness, of judge, of lawyers, of defendants, security guard, court clerks, the nonverbal cues, the behavior. And what is the role of all that? What does the literature on nonverbal communication says about the impact of behavior? Well, behavior help us display effect, reveal attitudes, uh, regulate interaction, manage impression, exert interpersonal control. And I would like to focus on two functions that I think are very important in court. Nonverbal communication plays a huge role in creating empathy on the one side. And on the other side, Nonverbal communication also play a huge role in creating authority. And there's a fine line in, 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 the, in, in, the, the, in empathy between empathy and authority. For example, the judge on, the, on, 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 on one side, there, there's need to be some authority in how the 
the trial proceeds. But on the other side, the judge also has to show empathy, for example, when victim has to testify in a way, in a way, so with all, um, uh, with all the other constraints, but if you want someone to speak and explain the, an experience be showing some kind of empathy is very important so that the person can and will disclose information. One thing that is very, very important on the, also to, to, to be aware of is that all those functions, nonverbal communication is very important, but please, people have to stop thinking about nonverbal communication just as a way to detect lies. <laughs> There's no cues, nonverbal cues to detect lies. This is science fiction. So let's forget the impact of nonverbal communication to detect lies. Let's just forget that and think about all the other functions of nonverbal communication, displaying effect, revealing attitude, and so on and so forth. The other thing that is important about nonverbal communication that I would bring to this table for discussion um, is that most of the nonverbal cues and behaviors and features, we all appreciate that spontaneously. So on a daily basis, we use nonverbal communication in our interaction. It regulates our interaction. It helps us understand each other's, but all most of that is done very spontaneously. Um, and the final uh, thing that I would like to mention is that, well, the trial is an act of communication. So this is really, really important. Judges communicate it with the witness, so a witness communicate with the judge, lawyers communicate with the witness, and so on and so forth. The public uh, can see a trial or hear about trials. These are all acts of communication. If you remove the nonverbal communication from the equation, it changes the act of communication. And how does it change it? Well, what research shows about nonverbal communication is that it is extremely important in our daily function of understanding each other. Unfortunately, with virtual trials, as with trials in person, there is, again, I want to mention it, there's not a lot of research on nonverbal communication in courtrooms. Well, if virtual trials now begin to be more and more popular, my intuitions tell me that more and more researchers will look at the impact of nonverbal communication. And this event today is an illustration of this impact that is getting more and more attention. And um, please don't take my words as an opposition to virtual trials. It's just that I would, I and other researcher would probably like to minimize the collateral damage of virtual trials that we might not be aware of today because of a lack of research. So that's what I would like to say for the moment. Thank you, Vincent. That was most illuminating. Um, there is commonality between your areas of, of expertise. Um, and I, I particularly look at the intangible cultural heritage of courts and that's because I need to find a way to understand how the rule of law is actually communicated and how justice is accessed in space or virtual space or any kind of space in order to um, look at the next iteration of courts, if you like, that are coming sooner than we think. Um, so for both of you, I'd like you to discuss very briefly whether you think materiality is a form of nonverbal communication, given that we are talking about um, the difference between a physical court and interface, if you like, between society, whatever is going on in that society, whether it's in a war-torn civilization or, or an established democracy, um, that interface at the moment is represented by a physical court building and people are reacting, relating to that along with all of its material qualities which all communicate at different levels in different ways so is that vincent do you think a form of nonverbal communication well, in, 
<clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, Lorna, for the question. Um, I think uh, this is my opinion based on the knowledge that I have read, uh, the peer reviews that I have read in the past. But um, courtrooms, uh, court, uh, the court, so the physical environment where the witness is testifying, where the trials happen, is nonverbal communication. In a way, well, researcher could argue that, well, there's not the element of intention uh, or something of an intention similar to gestures or facial expressions, but uh, still um, the courts, the place where witness testify, the, the place where the judge sits. So uh, a little bit in the front of the room, a little bit up. These are all elements of nonverbal communication which creates impressions and communicates information to uh, everyone in the room and the public. Alex? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, I've, you've been hugely influenced by people's work who's on the, on the panel and, and uh, uh, Linda Mulcahy's work on, on legal architecture, you know, which, which conveys precisely this point that uh, the, the organization of, of court spaces, of, of courtrooms is it, it both, both reflects and communicates certain social attitudes towards towards law um, and and towards the organization of authority and so on and so we get these kind of micro geographies of of court spaces you know that are as as, as Vincent just mentioned you know hierarchically organized have certain sort of fixed settings that 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 reflect certain attitudes towards uh, participation in 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 court court processes, um, but also you know as as, as reflecting on you know, the actual the actual legal the, the the court buildings themselves they are they are symbolic buildings that are that are trying to convey certain certain ideas of authority so they are very much communicative devices um, albeit not textual or verbal but architectural. Okay, I think we have some questions um, which we may. Uh, like to, um, Nikki, would you like to filter questions? The questions that we have in the questions and answers are actually more referring back to the last session so far. So no, I was I... going to bring in Jody Blackstock's very important questions later on. Yeah. But I, I suppose actually we can um, bring it into this. Um, one of the things which is wonderful about this discussion is that we all come from different starting points and we learn other people's languages. So Alex just talking there about micro geographies and so on is new, for, un, unusual language for me as, as a criminal lawyer through and through. What Jodie Blackstock said in her um, comment was partly to bring um, attention to the ju justice, the NGO justice's virtual trial uh, and the test that they did there. Feedback was that wigs and gowns should be worn to aid the sense of solemnity. It's a really interesting question whether we want to have wigs and gowns, I think, in courts. The arguments are difficult to weigh up. Um, please do ha have a look at the academic evaluation by Linda McCarthy, who has just been mentioned now, and Emma Rowden, who's going to be speaking in a minute. This has not been adopted as yet because of reluctance to separate participants. But the Scottish example of having hybrid hearings where juries are in a separate setting seems to be working as a solution. Do speakers have any views on this? Well, you know, this is an informal seminar session. I'd be very happy if the earlier speakers wanted to come back, but I think I'll dump it straight on Alex because of his micro geographies. I don't quite understand what happens when you have a court which is then chopped up into different courts. So you, I'm not sure whether it counts as a micro geography if you have the courtroom with some of the participants in one room linked by video links to other participants in another room. And of course the public might be back in their own homes. So I don't know who would like to comment on Jodie's very useful comments. Well, just to say, just to say a couple of words, uh, Nikki, I, I think it's, it's, it adds a complexity to my micro geographies. Uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and I think this idea of, of you know, clearly it, 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 it introduces a, a different kind of psychology to the, the, the idea of, of place and, and people's kind of shared experience. If, if, it, if we have these mediations through, through video, links um I, I i i'm just to throw into the discussion about solemnity i'm just i'm always really interested in this question of the role of of court spaces and the ideas of gravitas and so on um and the ways in which 
this is uh, you know can flow into kind of ideas of um, the the courts as uh, degradation ceremonies or the, the the they have certain kind of roles in changing the status of individuals through their through their 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 enactment and so I'm, I'm just kind of yeah I'm, I'm I'm kind of weighing up some of these issues myself so um, I'm I'm not certain. Well, it is interesting, um, and it's going to be discussed in some more detail in the next discussion, um, where Emma and I have a chat about that, I hope. Can I chuck, chuck in at this moment Richard Posner's point, which seems to be relevant? If policy in different adversarial jurisdictions is seeking to embed virtual hearings, especially in trials, then perhaps we should know whether access to justice and public confidence would be better shaped through an inquisitorial system of justice in criminal law. And he's inviting views there. And of course, the first starting point has to be um, what we mean by inquisitorial as opposed to adversarial jurisdictions, because certainly in Europe, um, we have been growing more similar in many ways and borrowing in um, bits from different systems. So I think we can't see pure adversarial or pure inquisitorial models. But I do think it's a really important question in relation to what we're talking about today and virtual courts, whether we have to change the whole way we think about the order of questioning, the relative power and status of the performers. And Alex and Vincent in particular, would you like to respond to that? Yes. Um... Well, that's a point that I never thought about, but it makes total sense to think, to reflect on these possibilities because yes, uh, virtual trials change the whole interaction. And if it changes the whole interaction, why not um, uh, question the possibility of what would be best for the justice system? I'm, I'm, I don't have an answer yet. But really, it brings to my mind something that I really never thought about. And uh, the judge being more uh, questioning more, asking more questions. Um, would it be would it be better? Um, really, I'll, I'll have to have a think about that. <laughs> but that's very, very interesting idea. Never, never passed to my mind. I just say just say one point and, and and it may yeah it may or may not be relevant but but you know the the, the question is allied to it to the kind of broader question of kind of lay participation in in the in the kind of adversarial trial process and the the use of the use of juries and and i think that that there is the the, the challenge of um not just kind of virtual hearings, but increasing complexity of, of evidence in cases that that then cr creates the challenge of introduce you know, of, of jury trials. And so I, th I think while it's slightly off topic, I think it does kind of start to, to stray into some of those some of those kind of wider questions of um, the, the uh, admissibility of certain forms of evidence. Um, you know what? What kind of testimony is is considered appropriate testimony um, for for uh, viewing by by juries and being weighed up appropriately by juries? So, um, yeah, I think it's a, an interesting area of discussion. I think it's going to be a balance between you know, what's leading and what's following. You know, are we redesigning in order to create a better a better experience, or are we going to let the technology lead us and mm basically dictate what we end up doing. So though that's why we need research right now, because we, we can't really say for sure what we're losing and what we're gaining. Um, that's my take and um, that's my position. But thank you both for that, that discussion. Um, I think Nick, Carolyn um, might be wanting to come in with a point oh. on that last question. Are you Carolyn? I saw you come back into real life. So I thought you might want to comment. I, I was actually the earlier question um, looking at the um the uh, sorry where is it it's disappeared on me um looking at the um solemnity of the actual court um 
that that particular question about the hybrid hearings and going back to that justice report as well. I just was purely wanted to make a comment actually. Um, the number of cases, at least in Australia, perhaps they're better, better behaved in, in England and Wales, but in Australia there's been so many cases of people acting in a very disinhibited manner in uh, videos, uh, in video links. So especially if they're sort of appearing from the custodial suite, there's been, you know, cases of people deciding to, you know, take their clothes off or turn their back um, to the to, to the uh, judge. Um, and so sort of, it's really interesting. The difficulties in trying to manage, which, which also ties in with someone else's question, I think that the problems of trying to manage a virtual court when everyone is um, spread out um, in, in different places and where you're not immersed in that gravitas. Uh, you feel perhaps like we all do um, online that you can sort of feel a little bit um, free to act as you want to do and you don't necessarily feel that you're subject to the authority of the court. So I think it can be quite difficult um, in these situations. So I just wanted to actually address that um, earlier question as well, that sense of solemnity and how that's perhaps missing. We have a comment from um, a judge in Quebec who says, um, this is Pierre Gagnon, I'm not sure if I've pronounced that correctly, who says he hasn't experienced major drawbacks gathering evidence and submissions in the course of virtual hearings. However, he is concerned that some participants may come out believing that they didn't get a real complete and fair hearing. So his very limited solution, he admits, is to open a second camera targeting his face, which sounds some, like something that we recognize from the uh, justice virtual trial experiment. Um, Pierre, if you'd like to look that up, I think you might find something interesting there. Um, but thank you. Um, Nikki is going to take over now because it would be somewhat self-serving to introduce myself. Um, Penny, you came back to life also. Did you want to last comment on that last session or are you simply listening and you need to unmute yourself? Yes, it was um, a very quick comment and that comment from the judge in Quebec sort of pre preempted what I was about to say because we heard Carolyn talk about people feeling disinhibited but I think they can feel disenfranchised as well so that they're not participating but more of a feeling of justice is being done to them especially if it's a remote hearing which you do get remote here uh, sorry a hybrid hearing where you get the lawyers for example in the courtroom with the judge but the hybrid part of it is that other people like witnesses and parties are dialing in remotely so you could see that disinhibition disenfranchisement coming to the fore perhaps as a result of that. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, thank you. Well, we will then move on to our third section of our debate today. I'm really pleased that the um, discussions, the presentations are developing beautifully. There are some really interesting questions coming. Um, Bradley Reed, please read his second input on that. And then anonymous, um, attendee who raises the really important point about um, what anonymous attendee sees as uncritical support from judges, court officials and legal journalists. Well, that's what I think we academics have got a duty to do, which is to try and make the debate sufficiently interesting to engage those who are not yet engaged with the debate. So in this section, um, it's great pleasure to introduce Emma Rowden and sort of introduce Lorna, but she's already been well um, visible already. Um, Emma has been less visible today, but very visible in the discussion of this topic. She um, will, I hope, I'm not going to introduce you at any length, Emma, I hope you will introduce yeah. yourself. I'm really pleased to see you here today. Um, you're now based in England at Oxford Brookes University, having yourself been in Australia for many years. And it's really useful to have your contribution. I'll say nothing more about Lorna today. She's going to speak second in this section and can, of course, put herself more in context in relation to her work as an architect, a senior lecturer in um, architecture and design at the University of Lincoln and as a PhD student. Um, it's a really interesting position to be in, I think. But we'll start by inviting 
Emma to say what you want to say and to comment in what you've already heard this afternoon. Over to Hi there, you. can everyone, oh, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I'm just gonna share a few slides with you just cause I find them the visual helpful to uh, coming from an architectural background. Can everyone just see the screen I have, which has the PDF up? Is that visible to everyone? Yeah, yes. okay, so, not, okay. so yeah, thank you so much um, for um, that wonderful introduction, Nikki, and, and thank you uh, to both you and Lorna for um, hosting today. Obviously, the, given this um, topic is very near to my heart, um, I've been looking at this area for the last 10 years or so plus. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's one that I find endlessly fascinating and interesting. And obviously it's become very topical given, given the last uh, year's developments. Um, so just to introduce um, my background, so effectively I've been looking at this area um, for a while now and it all sort of started off with the Gateways to Justice project, which I'll talk to you a little bit about, which like Carolyn's work in, in prisons, that was sort of the, the major project that I worked on um, in this area that provides the bulk of my knowledge really um, and expertise in this area. But I've also been involved with Carolyn and with some other colleagues in a number of different projects um, Two involved looking at the um, uh, how we might improve video linked interactions for people on remand, and I'll talk a little bit about those those two projects. And then also in the UK, um, Linda Mulcahy, a long term collaborator, and I've uh, just recently um, won a bid in the UKRI COVID nineteen rapid response grant um, for the supporting Justice Online project, which again I'll talk to you a little bit about. And also um, I'll talk briefly about the work we did with Justice, which Jody has also mentioned earlier. So just sort of some further reading, um, the book Linda and I produced um, recently, The Democratic Courthouse, which looks at the last sort of 50 odd years of court design in the UK. Um, and really it sort of looks at the moment just before now where the courts for the last sort of, uh, I think since the early 2010s have been undergoing this rapid modernization project, which COVID has really, you know, made it sort of more urgent that, that this work um, sort of come to its, its fruition. <laughs> but, but effectively, we looked at the sort of um, the, the moment before all this when, when the, the UK was investing in, in the infrastructure of courthouses. It was the last big monumental building program. So our book really examines that and the kind of lessons we can learn from the mistakes, I think, really, that were made during the, the, that era. Um, in terms of how we can make our courts more, more democratic. And then just some um, other research, um, uh, other uh, publications that came from the Gateways to Justice um, project, really highlighting two areas that hadn't really been looked at much in the literature at all, which is the impact of audiovisual links on experts and the idea of an expert performing their expertise on a video link. And it, um, a lot of the issues that Vincent talked about earlier about nonverbal communication, the fact that people demonstrate their expertise through non, you know, the way they, they demonstrate things through their hands and through their, their nonverbal um, communication. Um, that's something that we, we address in that paper. And then another one with my colleague, Anne Wallace, on remote judging and again an area that hadn't been looked at much at all which is the impact of video links on on uh, the work of judges and judge craft so um just you know in case you're interested um and then i guess the third paper i wanted to highlight here was the distributed courts and legitimacy paper which actually talks uh more to the issues um that this particular panel is talking about today sort of what do we lose when we lose the courthouse when we move into this kind of virtual scenario um, some other things I just wanted to point out was the sort of scope of the Gateways project and the fact that we produced um, some design and operational guidelines um, out of that work that's freely available online. And then just um, to highlight some of the work that Carolyn and I did together with some colleagues at UTS, um, looking at um, how to improve the, the court experience for those on remand in terms of the preparation that you give to them for the remote encounter and how that might actually improve, improve things. And that included um, just some basic information about what is AVL, who's who in the courtroom and, and how are you going to appear in the court. And it also included some pre-connection videos and some, um, I guess, uh, sort of training videos um, introducing what, what, the, what the remote encounter would be like. Um, and that sort of work has sort of um, 
sort of carried forward now, um, both in terms of looking at the Justice's jury, uh, virtual jury trial, which um, Jody mentioned earlier, I really encourage you to have a look at it. I mean, one of the things that I found quite groundbreaking about it was what an even level playing field that um, that this, a lot of the issues that had been raised in my previous research about the, the, the sort of issues, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute, um, seem to be sort of in a way by putting everybody remotely so that there isn't an us and them, sort of us in the courtroom and them who aren't in the courtroom who are beaming in remotely, that it, that it did create a very different kind of geography. And I think that's something that Alex might be interested to look at in terms of his micro geographies. Um, so yeah, for those of you who, who haven't looked at that, that research and that evaluation, um, I, I uh, recommend you have a look at it. And these are the three reports that uh, Linda and Wend um, and I uh, produced on the back of that. And then just going forward, this new project that we're looking at in terms of the Supporting Online Justice Project, um, where we're looking, we're, we're sort of shifting the focus away from criminal courts and looking more at family courts and tribunals and, and the ways in which we might better educate lay people through that kind of audiovisual approach um, in terms of how to improve their kind of skills and um, in their capacity to engage and effectively participate in an online setting. Um, so I'll leave it there in terms of my introduction. Maybe I've got a few more slides that maybe when we get to the sort of the bulk of what it is we're talking about today. Um, Lorna, I'll, I'll hand it over to you for, for a little bit to, to introduce yourself and... Sure, thank you. Um, uh, Emma and I have been chatting for a few years and she's been incredibly supportive of my shift in career into academia and uh, and she's given me a lot of very good advice which I've tried very hard to follow. Um, my introduction will be very short because I'm relatively new to academia so I don't have a huge um, wealth of, of published work behind me that I can draw on. Um, so I'm just going to, to say what I have been doing recently. Um, so, as you know, my background is in architecture and for many years I've been in practice designing interventions in existing buildings to give them new life uh, and purpose. So the criminal courts are amongst the most important group of public buildings um, to show us how buildings carry and convey societal meanings. They're read by individuals who use them and through that process they contribute to the sense of place that exists in these very important public buildings. My research studies the role that courts and courthouses play as the buildings and as places which express the complex but symbiotic relationship between the individual and the state. And in particular, as an expression of the rule of law to the society it serves. This relationship is tested through both architectural analysis and socio-legal approaches in my research. And recently through the applied design process um, to develop interventions to enable jury trials to resume um, in the height of the pandemic crisis last year. Um, this was achieved through a judicial working group led by Judge Guy Curl, QC, recorder of Leeds, and the public, published work was entitled The Nightingale Court's Report. Um, it was adopted by HNCTS, and now that work underpins uh, their efforts to adapt the court's estate to cope with the effects of the pandemic on the very high backload, backlog of case, case, outstanding cases. So the work to identify host buildings for the new Nightingale Courts allowed me to contribute my design expertise to help resolve the problem of how to reinstate jury trials and to provide a model for courts of different levels of security and in different cluster arrangements to be located in host buildings, such as the NEC theatres, lecture halls, cathedral complexes and guild halls across England and Wales. This is a complex design challenge um, and it required that I take a base model on which to generate the design. Um, this is not an approach that um, researchers normally take, but this is a, an approach I would take in practice if I was faced with this particular kind of problem. So I identified the individual juror as the core unit for the model and designed a safe three-dimensional space for that person according to the two metre and one metre plus distancing rules. This I then extrapolated to a full jury in various arrangements um, in consultation with the lawyers who I was working with and eventually to the entire courtroom through examining each individual required for the trial to be staged. It's an iterative design process and required that each um, participant was considered in turn. Their space was identical to, to each other's and as was safe access to that space. 
um, the choreography within the courtroom um, was considered in minute detail and managed to expose individuals to the least possible risk in moving around the courtroom and video link technology and access spaces were integrated into the model on the same basis. So um, I could go on about this uh, because there's a lot, a lot of work that went into it, but basically very complex courtroom planning was simplified enough to allow easy and access, uh, easy quick space requirements to be matched to potential host buildings. Um, and the approach placed every individual player in the court on an equal basis with each other. This provided a basic model for a courtroom, which um, has potential, I think, to, um, to develop as a model for future courts, uh, because it stripped out all of the, uh, all of the sort of design is never neutral. So whatever courts we have, nothing in them is neutral. It's all there for a reason. It all has something to say and it all contributes to the way that people read that space. So when you start from scratch, you don't have any of that to deal with and you just have to look at the actual core function of that space and how people are going to read that space and interact with it. Um, so I'm not going to say any more about that right now. Uh, and I'm going to ask Emma about her virtual jury experiment that she ran with justice and the conclusions that she came to with, Mo with Linda in, in the report and ask, you know, can we really, can we do without physical court spaces altogether? What is your view on that now that you've run that experiment? Um, thanks, thanks, Lorna. Um, well, first of all, I should just clarify, it was actually Justice's experiment that we were very kindly asked to come and come and review and, and critique and, and contribute towards in, in some way. So, um, but, but I did find it really a, a fascinating project to be involved with, because as I said earlier, a lot of the critiques I'd been levelling at, at the video conferencing process, I found weren't necessarily completely addressed by this, this new format, but in some ways um, they threw up kind of new possibilities and in particularly this, this notion of the, the us and them, you know, the us in the courtroom and the feeling like the poor cousins who are <laughs> having to video link and some of the issues that that, that was raised. It, it gets sort of uh, uh, everybody's sort of uh, on the same kind of uh, form, everybody's sort of visually represented on screen but, um, location, not, you know, a sort of a central hub. Um, but then, you know, some of the things that, you know, we've been complaining about are also still, still occurring. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of, in terms of some of those issues, I'll just, um, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with my, my research to date, I just wanted to sort of raise some of these points. So, so one of the questions you asked, Lorna, is about sort of what is the physical court? What does it do? What does it what does it do that that provides that is important to us? And is there a potential for this to be missing in the virtual or video link spaces? And again, you know, if we think, well, you know, what is needed for a courtroom? You know, if we go back to sort of some of the drawings I did for Linda's book, um, you know, that really the the pre democratic courts there were these sort of um, you know it was a hall basically people just got bits of furniture together. And, and if we think about what a court is in terms of um, how it's sort of shifted over time, in our head, we're sort of thinking, oh, a courthouse has these sort of symbolic things attached to it. But effectively, it's people coming together in a space and determining something on behalf of community. And so really, actually, if you, if you forget about the sort of the architecture itself, what it needs is buy-in. It needs everybody to be buying into this experience that we are all um, coming together and, and we're coming and making a collective decision. Now, how do we get that buy-in? Well, part of it's creating the sense of legitimacy and, and part of it is creating a sense of um, that, that, that the speech acts that happen in the setting are going to have an effect. And we do that through all sorts of, of, of um, you know, as, as theorists might talk about this in terms of a network, a network of relations and assemblage that, that we give sort of weight or prominence or some kind of as a collective, we all agree that the judge, when he, when they they make an um, a, a proclamation, you know that this is occurring, that that has some weight outside of this setting. So, in a way, if we think about, you know, part of that is about these sort of environmental behavioural cues, but a lot of it 
sorry if I got is, is about the creation of this rite of passage this liminal zone where the stuff that happens within a court space however defined whether it's virtually or whether it's actually in a in a physical setting that something's going on there people have particular roles and and stuff that happens in that setting has an impact outside of it um, and part of the reason, part of what we do that is the creation of what's called a civic space in good source terms um, that there's, um, you know, and that, that in terms of architecture can happen in all these sorts of ways in where we look at sort of a ceremonial space, we look at, and ceremony again doesn't necessarily need to be in the architecture itself, it can be inhabited in the rituals, it can be inhabited in dress, there are all sorts of other kind of signifiers that can stand in. So I mean when I was doing my research and talking to judges, you know, I spoke to one land environment court judge who talked about going out on site and recreating the kind of sense of a court through the way they spoke to people, through the way they explained what was going on. So there are sort of different, um, different ways in which the notion of court can be uh, created that is devoid of space, you know. So I think there is some potential in, in the virtual setting for this to be recreated, but we might lean more on these other tools at our disposal. We might lean more on dress. We might lean more on, you know, the background, the backdrop to our surroundings. We might lean more on the kind of rituals and protocols we set up for establishing that formal setting, this civic space. Um, and, and I guess, but we don't want to lose what happens in the court space, you know, that part of it is a formal arrangement of people where people know their roles and know what happens in this communal organisation, but it's also about the environmental cues that, that, that people are triggered to have particular behaviours. And that's sort of really what the courthouse in a way, I think, traditionally has sort of stood in for, for us understanding those relationships between players, but also in terms of triggering formal behaviour, which is why when we've been talking about video links and people sort of maybe not, not really appreciating that they're in a court space or appreciating that they have to behave in a particular way because when they're having these kind of conflated behavioural cues, as you see here, we've got the discrete court and the remote space. Well, actually, if you're in a remote space, often you're getting this kind of confliction between a formal setting that you're looking in at and this kind of, you know, you know, haphazard space that you happen to be in, whether it's, you know, at the moment, uh, sort of, I'm in my office, or, or, um, you know, somebody else in a, has appeared, um, you know, in a magistrate's court as a expert witness as a doctor, but from the sort of office tea, uh, from the from the hospital tea space, you know, so sort of seeing people off on the side. So there are all sorts of ways in which um, the ways in which the video linked encounter can sort of transform some of these norms. It's up to us to kind of re redesign in a way, what is it that we're leaning on to create that sense of community values that are, that are uh, creating that sense of legitimacy of the, of the court encounter. I think I'll, I'll leave it there really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Sorry, you. A bit of a tangent. Thank you. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was given all that and given, given our approaches, do you think the courts have the power to be transformative? Or are we simply required to make them neutral backdrops to a show that's being played out by all the different players that are involved? Architecture is never neutral, as you know. And no, ab absolutely. And look, some of my work in Australia, I think, you know, the, the sort of ideas I've been, been exploring in terms of particularly, you know, it, because in a way the courts should be emblematic about what a country wants to say about it or what a, what a sort of jurisdiction wants to say about itself, both to, to basically to its citizens, you know, what values as a community do we want to uphold and, and how do we express ourselves? And so, you know, when we see um, in Australia, you have some new court buildings where um, Aboriginal artists are invited in to sort of paint, paint the, the walls of the court space, or you have, um, you know, in a, in a sort of similar uh uh, example, you know, in terms of the use of art, um, you know, in a, in a magistrate's court, a particular um, a story from a particular magistrate who worked um, worked in the area spoke of a a, um, a young Aboriginal boy who'd gone through um, a, a sort of rehabilitation program and gifted to the court uh, an artwork that they had done, and so you know, people in the court now sit underneath this artwork that this person had had. Um, delivered to the court. So there is, I think, um, a great transformative potential of courts for, for jurisdictions to reimagine themselves, but also to kind of keep that dialogue with its citizenry about what is important, you know, what is, what are the values that we want to be upholding, um, you know, in, in our justice system. Um, so I, absolutely, I think there is um, a, a potential transformative power of, of the courts. And I guess that becomes more challenging, perhaps, 
when you're distributing that space, when you're not having an architect coming in there and saying, okay, this is what the court needs to look like, um, um, but, but everybody's sort of being connected. But I think, again, as I say, you know, if you look at this as a network of symbolism, you know, might be in the way in which we, we, um, we relate to each other, that respect is amorphous. You know, it's not necessarily something that, that is, um, has to be expressed only in bricks and mortar. It's also in how we, how we treat each other, how we, how we denote dignity and respect. And those sorts of things can can be, um, I guess, expressed in, in multiple ways. Yeah. Um, one example I can think of is the uh, Supreme Court in South Africa, where they constructed the new court out of the remains of one of the most notorious prisons from the apartheid period. So a lot of the graffiti from the prisoners is still on the walls, the, the steel structure is still there, and it's in the same place. So it's in the landscape that was, you know, a result of those effects. So it can be read in a particular way. And I think, Alex, your experience in uh, Bosnia, Sarajevo, um, was, is probably similar. Do you have anything to add? No, 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 not at all. I mean, yes, it is. It is very, very similar. Just, just listening with real interest to, to, to this exchange. I mean, I think the, um, the, the, in some senses, it's, it's kind of the polar opposite. I think. In, in the case of in, in, in Bosnia, the international community were trying to draw on precisely, you know, Emma, the point you're making about about the kind of possibility of of architecture to embed a, a new and you, you know unified legal system. Um, unfortunately, you know, in in the in the kind of in the years since, uh, uh, you know, um, different ethno national politicians have. Have sought to kind of reinject kind of forms of antagonism through uh, interpreting the architecture in different ways, you know. So, so it's it's the idea of of, of the, the kind of the, the the kind of ideal that this would uh, establish um, a, a a unified political and legal system, but but actually through its interpretation and particularly through through the issue that it was the site of um, of of war crimes um, perpetrated against. Um, uh, Serb uh, prisoners of war. Then this this led to uh, a kind of reinterpretation and, and, a, and a suggestion that this was, in some senses, uh, biased against kind of uh, the, the, the Serb community. So it's kind of interesting that symbolism, I suppose, can cut both ways. There's also yeah, a temporal I, I, yeah. aspect. Sorry, Emma. Uh, that's all right. I was just going. Sorry, go on, Emma. It's fine. I was just going to say there's also a temporal aspect to all of this. So whatever we create at any one point in time, it has to be capable of, of changing and adapting and continuing to be a reflection of aspirations for justice in, in that context. Um, and quite often these courtrooms, these court buildings have lived a very long time and seen an awful lot of history in their context. And they, but yet they still seem to hold some power, which is interesting because quite often, particularly in Ireland with the, you know, the the uh, Neo-Georgian uh, courts, which are effectively colonial architecture in place in a position of authority over a subject nation at the time, um, they are revered buildings and they're still loved and they're still used because they have translated themselves through time and they've been embodied with that by the people who use them. So that's, that's another important aspect. Sorry, Emma, what were you going to say? No, no, sorry, Lorna. I was just going to say, uh, rejoinder to Alex's point. I think absolutely. And I think, you know, what the, the transformative power, I believe, is completely undercut if those if the symbol isn't matched by the the kind of you know the on the ground relationships and the the changes politically. So I mean, you know, until we have um, you know uh, more Aboriginal people represented, you know, as, as, as within our ju judiciary, and until we have you know lower rates of of or more equal <laughs> equal rates of incarceration. Um, between, um, you know, the, the different kind of groups more proportional to actually, you know, what, what the population is then, um, you know, and lower deaths in custody and things like that. So until that kind of real justice um, happens, then the, in a way the, 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 the transformative potential um, is undercut really. So I think, you know, those things need to be in concert really. Fascinating and very enlightening I would like to hand back to Nikki now because I think we need to go to the next discussion um, unless you, you want to go through some questions, Nikki. 
Um, well, we're well within our time, which is very useful. So I don't know that either of you two speakers want to say more in relation to this session, but I will broaden it out now for the last half hour before we end this session. So where do we stand? I think what is um, very interesting, as um, Carl Leclerc has said, appropriate background virtual or not is a good start. Uh, our discussion moved on in that last group to different shapes of the courthouse. Now, I, I've been very lucky in my career, as many people of my generation and um, my sort of world, to have traveled quite a lot. And I have always visited courts, even on holiday, wherever I am. And it is extraordinary how different our courts are and how within one jurisdiction, the Supreme Court and the local magistrates court or its equivalent will be giving a very, very different message, partly historical. Um, Lorna just said something about people loving their courts in Ireland. Well, it depends probably who you ask whether they love their courts or not. Um, and there are many, many issues in relation to court architecture and where you put the judge and whether he has a light on him, as we heard earlier on. And moving the discussion away from what court should look like to the advantages and disadvantages of digital justice, I think this discussion is of course fantastically interesting at a million levels, not least because it's a digital discussion and shows the advantages and disadvantages of invisibility or um, in relation to this encounter that we're having, which is very different from the encounter that we would have if we were all in the same room but we never would be all in the same room. So aren't we lucky? I think my agenda in welcoming Lorna's proposal that we had this webinar today was very much to get us to think about, hey, there are enormous things happening out there. Dig digital justice is moving really, really fast. And have we stopped and thought enough about the implications? And therefore we've encouraged everybody in this last session to think a little bit about what it is that um, future research should be looking at. I'm really grateful that everybody who's taken part today has agreed that we record this session. It will therefore sit on the um, Centre for Criminal Justice's website. And I hope we'll get lots and lots of hits. It will also be, I think, on YouTube. We'll announce where it's available. But in my previous experience of the webinars that we've been putting on in the last year, they have attracted an enormous amount of attention afterwards, as well as on the actual day of the discussion. So in this last section, I'm going to invite everybody who's spoken here today to have two or three minutes, so not just a word, but a bit more than a word on where they really want future research to focus. I think there've been some quite subtle messages today from the different directions that we come at the problem from, but let me straight away pass it back to all of you to have a word. Now we haven't choreographed this very um, deliberately, we haven't choreographed it very strongly because a discussion benefits from being a discussion, which is where I think the discussions earlier about inquisitorial adversarial is really interesting. That's one of my main messages as a black letter lawyer who's interested in who speaks first and who asks what questions. I think whether this new digital world, if we have to live in it, I'm very, very nervous of it, but if we have to live with it, whether it should embolden us to do some quite dramatically different other things as well. But I don't want to talk too much. I've just been um, speaking for a minute to give our panelists time to think about what they really want to say. And I don't know whether you want to speak in the reverse order that we did before or the same order, or for me to choose a random alphabetical order. I'd rather that democratically, ha ha, you choose. Who would like to speak first? Lorna wants to speak first, then you won't get another chance though. I so know, I know. I'll just set it because 
um, because I'm in a field with people who've got a lot more research background than I have. And I just, so in that sense, I just want to use this as an opportunity for a call to arms really for research. Um, I can't see anything improving without research. So I'd like to ask you all what your recommendations are for future research or analysis or inquiry and how you think the pandemic has created an opportunity for that research, which we wouldn't have had, I don't think. So anybody, any takers? Emma, I know you're about to start some research, aren't you? Um, which with Linda Malkahi, so perhaps you'd like to tell us. I, I sure, will but... select, we're going to go Emma, Alex, <laughs> Carolyn, and then you know you're on next. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the work I'm I'm undertaking with Linda um, Mulcahy and um, Anna Salapatanis at um, the University of Oxford, we've got a grant to look at ways in which we can use audiovisual tools to um, help um, enhance participation of lay people, particularly in uh, the family courts and also in um, tribunals, in terms of educating them about you know, what happens in a, in a virtual trial, how to kind of, you know, uh, how to ensure they have effective participation by being able to have their say, you know, have their voice heard, um, to know what the protocols and procedures are, you know, to know what to happen if there's a glitch, uh, to use uh, um, Carolyn's fantastic word, you know, how, how to kind of improve that experience for them so they have the confidence. And, and one thing that's really coming to the fore, actually, um, in, in terms of the things that we're discussing is, is um, you know, the fact that actually most people who come to court are coming, um, you know, will, will, will we experience sort of high levels of anxiety? You know, what can we do to kind of reduce and minimise people's um, anxieties about, you know, the unknown, about what they're about to step into? So, so that's sort of really, it's a very practical project in that, in that respect. But I think to the earlier points, I think, you know, um, so much of society is moving digital, digitally and, and we're sort of, you know, we're becoming more and more kind of familiar and comfortable with things like just, you know, never going into the bank anymore, but doing online banking and things like that. And, and so while, while we want to kind of reap the benefits of, of um, technology and how it can in, in help us, I think it is really important to kind of look at, at how things are being, um, you know, some of the, the, the things that were happening in that that space, you know, whether it be incidental contact with people. I mean, all of us are sort of moving away from our offices. And I know I've had loads of conversations with colleagues around, oh, we never have that chat, you know, that informal incidental chat. So for me, my my interest is in in the incidental, you know, what what happens when when we when we kind of transform the the physical setting. You know, how do we capture those things that, that get lost but but aren't necessarily valued, but they're there implicitly in the structure of things. So so for me, I think going forward that that is sort of what I'm one, you know, it's like how do we capture what is it that we're losing along the way and how can we transform that into a new setting? How can we reimagine it within these um, within this virtual space? Thank you. So we're going to go Alex Carolyn Vincent. Penny, and Penny, I'm going to also ask you to answer Bradley Reed's um, last question, but I'll read it to you if you don't have access to it. So we're going Alex, Carolyn, Vincent, Penny. Yeah, just, to, I mean, the, the first thing is that I'm going to um, uh, going to be following with, with real interest this, the, the research that, that each of these, each of the panelists are, are outlining, because it sounds, it sounds fantastic. I mean, I think one of the, um, the projects that I'm, I'm I'm picking up now is is continuing to be interested in this question of why uh, court location matters, um, and and that I'm starting a project looking at the uh, location of the trials um, uh, that the ICC is um, going to conduct into the Rohingya Muslim um, atrocities that uh, alleged to have taken place in in uh, Myanmar, Burma, and you know th this the 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 deliberation there is about where um, the trials should should take place um and it's just interesting to me that that this question of court location is is important both in procedural terms also obviously as we've discussed today in symbolic terms um and you know and does come to bear on questions of of access to to justice um it's going to be interesting to see how um the kinds of innovation that we're seeing and we discussed today in terms of um virtual participation 
um, start to reshape these questions around court location and proximity and, and war crimes trials. And uh, you know, substantively, how does this shape um, the, 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 the fundamental question that, that lurks in the background of whether or not um, individuals and groups feel that justice is, is being, to, being, uh, being done in, the, in, these, in these cases and what, what kinds of participation individuals have within these trials, pr trial processes where um, uh, they're increasingly being participating virtually. So um, that's, that's my uh, uh, future uh, research in kind of the area. And I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm fascinated to follow some of these questions around what, what virtual participation um, means. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. As I mentioned before, I've, um, in July, I'm starting this project, the Digital Criminal Justice Project, Vulnerability in the Digital Subject. Interestingly, my field work is supposed to include Australia, New Zealand and England and Wales, but it would be interesting to see if indeed I'm actually allowed to travel um, to your part of the planet, given the uh, pandemic at the moment. So I'm not quite sure if I'll get there or not. But basically, um, as I talked about before, especially during um, COVID-19, we can sort of see the, the rise of digital justice, as I talked about before. Um, we can see this widespread transformation of justice occurring before us. And perhaps this is occurring before all of these issues have been resolved. It's, that's sort of quite clear that we basically have, you know, through the urgency of the pandemic, just to keep the wheels of justice turning over, um, that we have this pilot, uh, a very loud, large scale pilot. But I guess what, do, what does that actually mean for vulnerable participants in the high stakes of criminal justice in particular. So I'm going to be looking at the impact of digital justice, um, the notion of looking at fair and inclusive justice for vulnerable users of criminal courts. I'm going to be um, aiming to um, you know, understand the range of vulnerabilities that are being presented um, in the courtroom endpoint of audio visual links. Um, I'm going to be, instead of talking to prisoners, though, I'm going to be talking to uh, judges and lawyers and getting their perspectives on how they deal um, or how they understand uh, vulnerability, how they deal with people who may be vulnerable um, you know how do we actually identify and triage people how do we know who actually needs some uh, adjustment in, in this actual procedure um, so I'm going to sort of be I guess there's a couple of aims that I'm looking at I'm going to be developing and sort of refining concepts of digital justice looking at digital vulnerability and very much um, the theoretical framework that I'll be using is this notion of digital criminology which is sort of an emergent um, understanding of the fact that we are now living very much in a digital realm you know it's just part of our everyday existence um, so I'm going to be hopefully applying these concepts to test existing practices to develop some alternate uh, recommendations to try and promote inclusive justice and to hopefully generate some strategies to better protect the vulnerable under digital justice so yeah, that, that's sort of going to be very much my focus um, coming 1st of July. And with any luck, I might get to see you in England um, if I'm allowed to travel. Thank you, Vincent. Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, you might hear some noise because my um, neighbor is uh, renovating. So <laughs> I'm going to try to make it as clear as possible. Um, in, the next, um, in the next year's um, I think um, one of the aspects that is very important is to study the impact of demeanor, uh, demeanor sorry, on, uh, in virtual trials um, compared to uh, the impact of demeanor in the, um, in-person trials. Because as probably most of you know, the impact um, of demeanor can be quite large in trials. A lot of trials are decided upon credibility of witnesses. And uh, one of the main factors of credibility assessment is the demeanor of witnesses. Uh, on that issues, I also think there should be a more research on the impact of facial stereotypes in uh, virtual trials. Uh, again, as probably um, some of you or most of you know, uh, facial stereotypes um, impact the way that uh, evidence can be assessed. And facial stereotypes can also uh, impact uh, the outcome of trials. 
So again, the um, the in-person versus uh, virtual trials of uh, the impact of uh, facial stereotypes should be uh, studied further. And finally, um, also um, uh, what I mentioned earlier is the um, the, the uh, empathy versus uh, authority of, uh, of, of trials and again, the impact of uh, the demeanor of not only uh, the witnesses, but the lawyers and, uh, and the judge. I, I think um, it was um, Carolyn that mentioned um, the, um, uh, the impact of virtual trials on cross-examinations earlier today. Well, this, this, is, this is extremely important because again, when, when it comes to demeanor, Let's not forget that it's not only about the witness, but there's also the judge and the lawyers and all of those interactants, uh, they contribute to the, the communicational scene of, of the trial. So that's, that's the plan for the, the next years. Thank you. And I already um, pushed towards Penny the question from Bradley Reed, which says, thinking about Vincent's point about the impact of nonverbal cues, could appearance by video link from a prison be considered to endanger biasing a jury? Is the panel surprised that there appears to be no Article 2 challenges so far? Um, is this an example of the problems of access to justice? I'm also very interested by Joshua Yarum's question, which anyone may want to refer to in a minute. What measures can be put in place to allow judges to effectively manage trials and act as the mediator between physical and digital participation to all involved. This is undoubtedly a complex world that we're examining today. And I dump both those complex questions on you, Penny, with your um, rounding up of where you stand today. Them. I'll have a go at the first. I don't know about the second, I haven't even thought about that. But um, Bradley's question about could defendants by video link be biasing? I mean, the short answer to that is yes. And then the other part of the question, are we surprised by a lack of a legal challenge to these sort of virtual joinings in on hearings? And for my part, I think no, because it comes back to research. If you were challenging it, on what basis really? I mean, who are you gonna call an expert witness who's going to say, well, we just don't know really. It could be biasing, it could be biasing in favor of the accused, it could be biasing the other way. So I'm not surprised that there isn't a legal challenge. And then it underscores this point that that I've made and a number of other people have made today which is that we need the research and I think that I would stress the importance of multidisciplinary research in this so we want the architects the sociologists the psychologists as well as the lawyers coming together and looking at the architecture for example I love this point about empathy versus authority as Vincent described it or Others have talked about power. We heard an example of a court being built, which I think in South Africa, which I think really underscored the humility. So you've got the sort of power versus humility or authority versus empathy point. How do you recreate that in the virtual environment? And I'm sure it must be important to do that, to have the power, but also have the, the, the humility. So um, really interesting stuff coming out here. And for, for, for my part, future of research, other people have mentioned what they're doing. We've just been awarded at ICPR with um, the lead being Professor Jessica Jacobson, who I work with a lot, uh, the lead being on a project on the coroner's court. We'll be looking at the participation of bereaved people in inquests. So that's where I'm headed from about May onwards in terms of um, major research projects. But thank you very much for letting me join and I'm gonna, stick myself on mute now and let somebody else have a go at that other question. Um, well, I'm going to pass the um, floor now to Lorna. I don't know whether you want to answer that question or, or whether you simply wish to um, sum up the conference from your perspective at this point, and I might get back to that question in a minute, but over to you now, Lorna. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming along and helping me unravel some of these many, many threads that I've been looking at for the last three or four years. Um, I've been looking at the courts for a very long time because I started in law and ended up in architecture and, uh, and the, the experience stayed with me. So as I see um, the courts change and in particular this 
this kind of paradigm shift that we're all living through at the moment where uh, everything seems to be becoming virtual at an enormously rapid rate, uh, pace. I just, I just became increasingly concerned that, that there weren't enough people looking at it in a cohesive manner. So we're all kind of looking at bits of it, but we're not all talking to each other that much, although obviously we all do read each other's research. Um, what comes out in conversation is often revealing. Um, and it's in, in the spaces between what we're all considering, but I think that there's power you know, to, to make a difference and to expand our knowledge. Um, I used an article I wrote in Council last May to call for more research and to use this small window of opportunity created by the pandemic to produce a sound body of evidence on which to base informed decisions for the future of digital justice and courts reform. So that window is not now as small as it was then, and the backlog in the criminal courts is increasing, and the crisis and justice system more critical. Um, despite the inception and implementation of the strategy, uh, which you put into the Nightingale Courts report, the potential remains for the backlog to simply outstrip the throughput of existing courts, and uh, the potential for misery and justice denied to so many victims and defendants waiting for their day in court is, is vast. Um, the next generation of courts is required. Um, speaking as a, an architect, so I can tell you it will take a couple of years before we have them, um, but we need them sooner than we expected to. And the, the pandemic remains out of control. There's no clear end to it in sight. Um, and the justice system can no longer rely on a swift return to normality to resolve the backlog. So we need to see um, a, a, you know, a functioning justice system perhaps more than any time since World War II because of the threat of the pandemic to public confidence in the justice system. So, so Ernest Ryder called um, earlier this week, or was it last week, for research and for a collaborative review of justice um, to provide a reasoned response to the pressures of the pandemic on the system. And perhaps a new model will result, but it's already clear that the design of the future spaces of justice will need to incorporate both physical and virtual spaces. Almost everyone seems to agree that there's no going back to the old model. Um, virtual justice in some form, having once been seen, cannot now be unseen. So it's a question of how we do that. And for my part, I'd like to see more collaboration between the likes of us to resolve that question. We can't all do this by ourselves, but we could all collectively make a difference, I think. And there's an opportunity to do so, so that we we end up with a system that, that works for everybody and not just the few. And that's all I have to say on the subject. Thank you. Um, Joshua's question about um, what measures can be put in place to allow judges to effectively manage trials is rather nicely, I think, answered by, um, let me go back into the chat, and we have the, a very interesting question, um, uh, response in the chat from, um, hang on, they're jumping around in my um, thing. Yes, Pierre Gagnon, um, in Quebec, we surveyed litigants, et cetera, et cetera. The most valued aspect of the process was respect. We've had a really useful discussion today, um, but what's missing, of course, is the voice of the defendants and the witnesses. And I think it is really important to try and hear their voices. Carolyn, I don't know whether you'll get to England and Wales in the next year, who knows? But um, we have proved today that we can talk to each other without having to visit each other's jurisdictions. And I am certain that we will, in continue this conversation. This interdisciplinary conversation is really, really important. So of course, is listening to the views and um, opinions of other users of the system. And it would be nice to know how we could bring that debate uh, or make that discussion more effective of bringing in court users more widely. I am going to, I think, wind, start winding up our, decision, our discussion in a moment. If anyone here, any of the speakers, um, want to have a last word, you're very welcome to interrupt me at this moment. Um, wave your hand or, or whatever uh, I, I'm looking. There has been enormous material. Um, the reading list, we've got an extraordinary 
um, presence here. Thank you so much. Um, the reading list that we've all got in these interdisciplinary worlds. Um, I like to keep an eye on what's going on in this world, but you've given me a, a lot more to read today, which is fantastic. Um, uh, this whole webinar will be available on our own YouTube channel, also on the CCCJ Law Cam Act UK website. If anyone can't um, find it, email me on nmp21 at cam.ac.uk and I'll tell you where to find it. I'm sure it's a debate that will go on. I hope that um, the panelists will be interested to be invited back. The world's a very fast moving world, isn't it? When we look back at 12 months ago before the pandemic, it feels like a very, very different world, not only in our personal lives, our research lives, but in what a court looks like, what a good court is and how a court functions. So I'm sure there's a lot of space for us to meet again. Thank you very, very, very much to everyone, especially Carolyn, for whom it is well after midnight. Vincent, who it is less early in the morning than it was when we started. But for those of you within this jurisdiction too, thank you enormously. And my main thanks go to Lorna, whose baby this seminar was. Thank you very much indeed, Lorna, for provoking us to do this debate. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.